Hello and welcome to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I am here today to start the 3K Q&A. If you are unfamiliar, you haven't followed along so far, I decided to celebrate hitting 3,000 subscribers by doing a Q&A. This was prompted by Kristen Ann, who made the suggestion, and I, I just agreed to do it. So the way I am thinking of doing this is that I have, I have pulled the first 25 comments off of the announcement video for this, where people were posting their questions, and I have them in a, listed in front of me, and I think that is probably going to be a good start. I'm going to go through them. If there's enough time, I'll pull some more questions, but I'm thinking that that will probably make for a fairly long video on its own, so I will have to do a part two, maybe even a part three. But before I get into it, I, I do want to say thank you once again, because that's a, that's a, a pretty good number. and. It's surprising <laughs> and really cool. And I, I really do appreciate the people who follow along, the people who take the time to comment, and it, it really means a lot. So thank you for that. That's the real celebration behind this Q&A. So let's get going. The first question is from Ty Emig Osler. I apologize if I said that wrong. And it, the question is, if you could have a conversation with any author, past or present, who would you pick? I'm going to go with Kurt Vonnegut. I'm really tempted to say E.M. Forster, because E.M. Forster is the person who supplanted Kurt Vonnegut as my favorite author. But I feel like it, and of course you could say like William Shakespeare or any number of other people, but I feel like Kurt Vonnegut is somebody whose work I really appreciate, so there's a pers personal connection there. But also, he just seems like a kind of fun guy. Part of the reason I really like Kurt Vonnegut is that he is somehow at once optimistic about what the human race is capable of, but also very cynical about what we will actually do. And he was kind of an absurdist. I've, I had, have seen a lot of interviews with him, and he just seems like a guy who it would be fun to talk to. Not that Ian Forster wouldn't be, but just for that reason, I think, being honest, like if, if I wanted to sound smart, I would say E.M. Forster, but the honest answer is that I think it would be fun to talk to Kurt Vonnegut and get a little bit more of a handle on his worldview and how he sees things. So that's my answer. Next question. This is from Peter Gardner. What are your favorite genres of music to listen to and what is your favorite board game? Music is really interesting because I, I do have very eclectic taste in music, and as I've gotten older, it's only gotten more and more eclectic. I used to never li really listen to country music. I think I mo mostly pretended not to listen to country music, but I actually do, and I've kind of embraced that as I've gotten older. But um, I don't really listen to new country. The only genre I've never really gotten into is rap. It just never really clicked with me at all. I'm sure if I really tried, I could find an artist who I liked. I just never really spent a lot of time. Oh, I'm not really into metal either. It just kind of gives me a headache. No, I mean, no disrespect to anybody who listens to rap or metal. It's just not for me. So that kind of, you know, it is what it is. But I will say I was raised on an oldies music station when I was a kid. That is what my parents listened to. And so it is the music that makes me the most nostalgic and feels like home to me. My first CD was actually a Beach Boys CD. I used to love the Everly Brothers. Like that, that's my wheelhouse. That's kind of what I grew up with. I love anything Motown, the Supremes. Oh my God, I love The Supremes. It's, it's so funny because if you listen to The Supremes now, the music is so codependent. <laughs> and like, you, if I had a daughter, I, I would play The Supremes and I would, I would sit her down and be like, okay, don't be like the woman in the songs, but they sound really pretty, don't they? So yeah, I, I just, I really love stuff like that. Anything from the 50s, 60s, 70s is my wheelhouse. I was a child of the 80s. I am a child of the 80s. But I, we didn't really listen to a whole lot of contemporary music. And there were stretches where we didn't have cable TV. So we, I, I missed out on MTV in its original days. And I, I, I was a, kind of aware of modern music. I just didn't really know a lot about it. Like I remember there was a girl on the school bus at one point who got made fun of because somebody slept over at her house and she had New Kids on the Block sheets. And allegedly, she kissed each one of the new kids on the block goodnight before bed. 
and everybody was making fun of her for that. And I had no idea, like no earthly idea who the new kids on the block were. I just thought it was funny that she kissed her sheet goodnight. So <laughs> that, was, that was my entry point to that story. And it was, I remember when I was uh, nine, my parents separated and we temporarily moved in with my grandmother on Long Island and she had MTV. So I, I did not see MTV for the first time until I was almost 10 years old. And it just, I remember one of the first music videos I saw was Janet Jackson's If, and it blew my mind. Anyway, I've gotten, I've totally gone on a tangent with this question. But the answer is, I, I probably would say my favorite genre would be like Motown or what people would call oldies. I really did get into 80s music, but I didn't get, I didn't listen to 80s music as it happened. I listened to 80s music in the 90s when it was already over and I was a teenager and had more access to pop culture. So I could kind of catch up on what I had missed in that decade. But so I, I would probably say like, anything oldies is what I would listen to the most. And that is what it is. In terms of a board game, there are a lot of board games I like. I don't actually play a whole lot of board games and it, I, I have a limit on, <laughs> there's a, a point in time in which I kind of stopped, my, my awareness of board game stops, I should say. I'm not really familiar with a lot of current board games. It's mostly stuff from my childhood. I'll say I hate Monopoly because I'm really bad at it and it takes forever to lose. So it's like this double whammy of pain and agony for me. I think my favorite game is actually Trivial Pursuit, but I don't necessarily like playing it with the board and everything. I just like sitting around and asking the questions. Some of my favorite memories are when my husband and I lived in New York, we used to go to this restaurant called Big Daddy's. It's like a diner, basically, in New York City. And they had little uh, little containers on each table that had Trivial Pursuit questions. So we would go there and we would, because we would also accrue dining points by eating there. And then we would just ask each other Trivial Pursuit questions back and forth. And it was a lot of fun. So I just for that, for the questions, I'd say Trivial Pursuit, but it's not necessarily for the moving around on the board, which is kind of a cheat for this question, I guess. But it is what it is. I really love the game Life, but I haven't played it in over 20 years. So, but that was probably my favorite game as a kid. Next question, The Broken Spine. Favorite and least favorite books so far this year? I know you have a foster son, but have you and your husband considered adoption? This is really interesting timing for this question because just yesterday I finished Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell and I have not figured out yet if it is going to supplant Song of Solomon as my favorite read of the year. I'm on this emotional high with it right now that I'm tempted to say Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell is my favorite read of the year. But there's so much that I love about Song of Solomon. And I think what it's going to come down to over the course of the year is that I have this emotional reaction to Hamnet, but I have this intellectual reaction to Song of Solomon. So it's really going to be about which one of those wins out in the end, about which one is going to be my favorite read of the year. And I honestly don't have an, I don't know, because it's today and I just finished the book, I'm going to say Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell but by the end of the year things may have balanced out to Song of Solomon because sometimes as you get distance from a book the emotional component can fade a little bit it's not as urgent so it's going to be interesting to see if that emotional connection to Hamnet sustains throughout the rest of 2020 if it does I mean it has a good shot like I said right now I, I would say it is my favorite read of the year but it's gonna be interesting to see if that holds up or if Song of Solomon takes its place back up and interestingly I did a buddy read of Song of Solomon back in January with Amelia Reeds who is a commenter and we are going to do a buddy read of Beloved at the end of the year because we want to begin and end the year with Toni Morrison books so it's gonna be interesting as well because Perhaps the best competition to Toni Morrison is Toni Morrison. So if the emotional reaction to Hamnet does fade, I, I could have a last minute switch and go for Beloved, but that's a lot of speculation. And again, I've kind of gone on a tangent with this question. It's just stuff I like to talk about. And that's why I'm gonna need probably two to maybe three videos for this Q and A. It's just stuff I think is interesting. So right now Hamnet, but possibly Song of Solomon will win out in the end. It has been my favorite read of the year until yesterday. So we will see what happens with that. 
least favorite read of the year. I will say there isn't any book that I've had a really overtly negative reaction to so far in 2020, which is kind of unique. But I'll, and I feel bad saying this, but if I had to pick one, I would say Where Reasons End by Yu Yun Lee, because it's, it very much hits a personal pet peeve of mine in literature, which is that I don't like novels as therapy, because if you read that, if you read somebody else's novel as therapy, it feels like listening in on something that you shouldn't be listening to. And it becomes kind of annoying to me. So, Where Reasons End hit that sweet spot. And it feels terrible to say that about a book that Yi Yun Lee wrote in reaction to her son's suicide. But it just feels like therapy that was necessary for Yi Yun Lee, but that I shouldn't have been listening to. I don't know, I always feel like an intruder in situations like that. So, for that reason, reason alone, I'm just going to say Where Reasons End. Although, I, with the addendum that nothing I've read in 2020 has been like awful or re made me angry or anything like that. And then what was the last part of this question? Oh, uh, so we have a foster son, but did we consider adoption? Yes, we did consider adoption. Uh, for logistical reasons, we, ne we never really considered having a biological kid. You can guess why, but also because a lot of people will say to us, oh, but you know, science has come along such a long way. You could have your own biological kid. And yeah, I could, but it's really expensive. It's prohibitively expensive to pursue one of those options. So um, yeah, the possibility is out there, but we, we never really considered it. I think it was pretty clear to both of us that we didn't feel an urgency to have a biological kid. My answer to the question is always that, you, that you know, people will say to me, like, aren't you concerned about your family line not getting passed on? My sister has two kids, so my family line is going to be fine. And then somebody once pushed back and said, well, you know, those are, those are girls. Are you worried that your name is not going to get passed on? And first of all, I hate that because it implies that my nieces don't count, and I don't like that. But also, the, you know, my last name is not uncommon. I have a male cousin who has kids anyway, but it's like my, the name's not going anywhere. I don't really need to worry about that. So we didn't have any sense of urgency to have a biological kid. So it was either adoption or fostering. Adoption can come along with like legal fees and things like that, and it can end up being expensive on its own. But I think in our hearts and minds, it seemed like fostering was the way to go for us at least because you kind of go where the need is and there's a lot of need there and we also had talked a lot about potentially getting an older kid because older kids are really overlooked a lot usually if people foster or adopt they go for the babies or the toddlers which is why i got so mad at elton john's autobiography last year because he said in it that if a kid spends nine months in in, in uh like any kind of institution like an orphanage or a foster home or anything like that it will permanently damage them and I really took issue with that because it perpetuates this idea that older kids and teenagers who are in the system are permanently damaged. I mean, many of them have suffered a lot of trauma, but they're not permanently damaged. And I really took offense to that. So we had it in our mind that that, would, that was what we wanted to do. Will we do it again? I honestly don't know. I think we need a little bit of space <laughs> before we think about doing it again. Plus, he still lives with us. Uh, he aged out of the foster program in June, but he still lives with us. And I think right now we're focusing on trying to make a permanent connection there rather than add to... And it, we're, as we try to figure all of that stuff out, it doesn't seem fair to bring in another kid. Because it it's a lot of work and it's a lot of stress. But uh, I'm glad we did it. So, there you go. Kristen Field said a couple of questions here. What books not yet published are you looking forward to reading? I wondered if you and your husband would ever think about doing a video together to discuss anything you want to talk about. Maybe he's camera shy. Well, Transcendent Kingdom by Yagyasi has not been published yet at the time I'm recording this, so I'm going to say that. Just make it easy. I really loved Homegoing, so I'm very much looking forward to reading another book by Yagyasi. Getting outside of that, I would probably say I'm really looking forward to Mark Harris's book about Mike Nichols which is going to be published next year. Mark Harris is a journalist in the entertainment 
industry and he has written two books before he used to write for entertainment weekly he was an editor there in what i would consider to be its glory days and I, when i i was a huge fan of entertainment weekly when he was working there and i still follow his work he's probably my favorite twitter follow i read his book pictures at a revolution and i've talked about it on the channel a lot it really ties in with my obsession with the oscars and movie history and things like that and he has another book called uh, Five Came Back, which was turned into a docu three-part documentary on Netflix. I've seen the documentary, but I have not read the book yet, and I'm really eagerly looking for it. And I'm not a huge Mike Nichols fan, but I know from his work that he is. Mike Nichols is one of the directors that he talked about a lot in Pictures at a Revolution because it talks about the five movies that were nominated for Best Picture in 1967. And The Graduate is one of those movies. So, but I, I just, I'd be willing to read anything that he writes. So getting outside of this year, maybe looking a little further ahead, that is a book I'm really looking forward to. As for, what was the other part of the question? <laughs> oh, my husband. So he is actually not camera shy. Traditionally, I'm shy. That's the, the actual story. I feel awkward asking people to come on my channel and do a video with me. I feel awkward telling people I have a channel for, for the most part. So it's not, it's not him being shy, it's me being shy and awkward. There were actually a lot of questions about him. Spoiler alert. So I did talk to him over the weekend and he said he would do a video with me. So we will, we will be doing that. It, but again, it's not, it's, it's not him being camera shy, it's me. It's, it's totally, I, I feel weird making a big deal about it. And that was actually, I didn't even tell him that I had a YouTube channel for about four months. It's because I, this is, and this is a very me thing to do, I did not want to talk about having a channel until I knew I was actually going to do it. I didn't want to say, hey, I'm going to start this booktube channel and this is what I'm going to do and then not follow through on it. And that's kind of the same thing. Like when I was working at Borders and eventually deciding that I needed to go back to school, I, I applied to community college and registered before I told anyone that I had done it because I wanted to make sure that I was going to stick with it and actually commit to doing it before I did it. So that's kind of something that has followed. It's like a thread in my life. And maybe I should think about that. I don't know. Next question, Chopsui061987 says, what made you want to start a booktube channel? I've been interested in starting one, and what is your favorite literary classic? Well, I started a booktube channel because I worked as a bookseller at Borders, I've referenced that a lot, and it's my favorite job I've ever had. If, I, if it was financially feasible for me to do it, I would go back to do it again. It's just not financially feasible. But I loved it, and I loved being around the books. I loved talking to people about books, knowing what books were coming out, and all of that. And so after I went back to school, I transitioned to publishing because I still wanted books to be that important in my life. And then publishing wasn't paying me very well, and it was not really financially feasible at a certain point anyway. And then we moved to Montana, where you can't really work in publishing. So I eventually left it. And the thing is, there are... Like, my husband reads from time to time, but he, I would, you wouldn't call him, like, a literary person. He's not, like, a book nerd like I am. My foster son is not a book nerd like I am. So that type of atmosphere was missing from my life. So I had started a blog a couple of years ago, never really got any traction with it. Because I never got traction with it, I would go through these phases where I'd be like, I don't want to deal with it, I don't want to keep it up. So I started doing it really inconsistently. So... I started a booktube channel to get that conversation back in my life and to find that same sense of community about books that I had found before. And it worked really well. I found the community very easily and I've, I've, I've really loved it. I also, there was an ulterior motive, which is that when after we moved here, I worked at a radio station and I was working with DJs on creating content for the websites. Um, which is, was writing, but then after I started there, they started really pushing into video content and everybody was very intimidated by creating video content, but there were kind of guidelines and things that you could do, like post consistently um, and things like that. But we couldn't really get anybody to do it because they were so reluctant to. So part of me was kind of also curious, like, okay, well, if you did it and really followed the rules and guidelines and recommendations, would it work? So I guess it does. 
basically. But there was an ulterior motive to kind of like everything I said first is the main reason, but there was that tiny little ulterior motive where I wanted to see like, does this actually work? And it does. Favorite literary classic. Oh, I'm gonna say The Catcher in the Rye. I know a lot of people hate that book, but for me, it is the book that has meant the most in my life, and it's gonna come up again in other questions, I think. We'll see. So next question is Tatia Deeg. Uh, Sorry if you've covered these before. Favorite book to film adaptations, including TV shows. What are your hobbies be besides reading? How did you end up in Montana? And the fireplace screen is beautiful. I love the fireplace screen. It was a pain to create real pain for many many reasons that I won't go into here but it really came out very well and that is actually one of the hobbies I'm going to jump to that one that we do my husband and I create stained glass and I will I'll put some pictures here of some of the things that we've done but that is that is one of our hobbies other than reading for both of us you can see some behind us the one in the middle we did not create but Joel did that one and I did the one you can never see because of the glare from the sun. So, but I'll put some photos of the ones that we have done. That is something that I think is really fun and I uh, enjoy doing outside of, creativ outside of creativity, outside of reading. I, and I really like the question about book to film adaptations. I actually took a class on literary adaptations in community college and I loved it. So, I mean, I could go with a lot of other things, but I'm gonna. Here's what I'm gonna say. I think two film adaptations that really improved on the source material are The Godfather and Jaws. Because Jaws is written in this very clinical way, and the ending is terrible in the book. That basically the shark just drops dead in the book. Spoiler alert. So it doesn't have the book. The movie makes it feel much more exciting. And of course, it has a much more exciting climax. So definitely Jaws. The Godfather is actually a really good book, but it has this really bizarre subplot about, if you've seen the movie, you know in the beginning, Sonny Corleone has a chance encounter that's not a chance encounter. He has an affair with a bridesmaid at the wedding that the movie opens with. And in the book, she has this entire subplot that takes up way too much space like it does not need to be there but it's there like the family sends her to las vegas she has this surgery that i'm not going to go into here but like it's this entire plot line that doesn't need to be there and the movie takes it out and there you do get a lot of the corleone family backstory in the book but when they made the godfather they cut it all they cut all of that out as well and it it's good that the movie succeeded because they actually use that as the framework for The Godfather Part Two, Like the entire backstory where Robert De Niro plays the younger uh, Vito Corleone is in the book. And I just think it was a really smart adaptation. So I'm gonna go with that and not be a nerd and talk about this too much more than that. How did we end up in Montana? Well, my husband had worked here. His first job out of culinary school was at Mini Glacier Lodge in uh, Glacier National Park. His parents, uh, his father and his stepmother live in Helena, Montana, so we came to visit them. And that's that's how I got to know Helena, and, or Montana, and fall in love with it because we don't live in Helena. And we came to visit them, and there was a day when my father-in-law, he was not my father-in-law at the time, was driving us somewhere and he needed to make a right hand turn and he had to wait for two or three cars to go by and then he looks at us and says there is a lot of traffic today and we just looked at each other and kind of knew that Montana was the place we were going to end up. We knew that for our life goals we didn't want to stay in the city like we didn't want to have a family and dogs in New York City so and Montana was the place we settled on so there you go. The Matic Reader asks what is your all-time favorite book, at least of this moment, since I recall you mentioning that your favorites change? Good attention to detail. For today, I'm, I'm going to say The Catcher in the Rye, because I think that's the book that has meant the most to me in my life. It really defined who I thought I was when I was a teenager. And I know a lot of people don't like that book, and I admit, I tie, I, for the reasons most people don't like Holden and The Catcher in the Rye, I kind of tied into that as a teenager. I'm not proud of it, but like I was this really depressed... Um, angry at the world teenager it is what it is but that I think is the book I felt so understood by that book at the time and I know I've talked about this but 
I used to reread it every year at Christmas because that's when the book is set. And then one year I read it and thought Holden was an idiot and didn't understand anything about the world. And I had this existential crisis about whether or not I had sold out or just grown up. And I think for that reason, it probably is the book that I would most frequently say is my favorite, which means I should probably just say that it's my favorite. But it does change. But most of the time it would be The Catcher in the Rye, if I'm being honest. Who is an author you haven't read anything by but want to? Oh, that is a tough one because there are a lot of authors that I've read about one book by and want to read more of. Like I mean, Toni Morrison, I'm on a quest to read more books by her and so far I've read three. And there are a lot of authors that I've read one book by but somebody I haven't read any of that I want to is Edwidge Danticat. I definitely want to read some of her books and I haven't yet. And Ursula K. Le Guin, I haven't read any of hers as well. So those are authors that I, I th that would fit the bill for this. Another Manic Reader question, if you had to read books by only one author for the rest of your life, who would they be written by? And again, I'm probably going to go, it would be tempting to go with Ian e. Forster because he's my favorite, but I'm going to go with Kurt Vonnegut because he has more of a sense of humor and can be a little bit twisted. And there's a little bit more variation in his writing. He can be a little more sci-fi. He does short stories. He does... He can be kind of absurd. He can be kind of serious. So there's, a, if I could only read him for the rest of my life, at least there's like a spectrum to cover. So I think I would go with that. Manic Reader also asks, non-bookish questions. Did you specifically want Welsh Terriers as your pet? Will your next door dog be named Hendrix after the gym? Good question. We did specifically want Welsh Terriers. I had never had a dog before, so my husband Joel had to sell me on having a dog first. And he did. And he had actually wanted a Welsh Terrier for a while and had already picked out the name Guinness. But he just had never, he even had a little dog tag for his keychain that said Guinness on it, but he had never gotten the dog. So he'd already picked that out. And he, all, when we decided to get a dog, he did say, I would like it to be a Welsh Terrier, but we can change the name. And I said, no, let's do a Welsh Terrier. Let's keep the name. We had thought about getting two, but then we were told that getting two as puppies is a bad idea because they'll bond so, so much that they'll kind of block you out. But we, when we were thinking about two, he said, all right, well, if we are going to do Guinness, then you have to pick the other name. And I thought to myself, okay, but what, go well, what goes with Guinness? The answer is obviously Jameson. And we were thinking, of course, of the Irish car bomb. So if we did, got a third dog, it would actually be Bailey to kind of complete the Irish car bomb. But uh, Jamie does not get along with other dogs all that great. She had a very hard adjustment period with Guinness. So we are not going to be adding a third dog anytime soon, but that would be where we'd go. But yeah, we did specifically want Welsh Terriers and that's how the names came about. And then, so Jamie kind of came around as an accident because we had a Welsh Terrier. We had a friend in town who volunteered at the Humane Society and she texted us one day to say, hey, a Welsh Terrier just showed up at the Humane Society. And we were like, ah, oh, that's, you know, Guinness is only a year old. He's not really potty trained yet. So we're not ready for another dog. And then she texted us, she texted us a photo of Jamie and we said, okay, well, clearly we have to meet her. And that, that's how, that's how we ended up with a Jameson to complete the two dog scenario that we had come up with originally. Andrew Russell says, how do you feel about fiction that has elements of poetry? I recently read That Reminds Me by Derek Owusu and found it challenging to get anything from the book due to its poetic prose. Question two, what book stands out as the most intimidating that remains on your TBR? And three, what is the most important element for you in a good work of fiction? Do you have a couple of examples that illustrate this? Okay. Question one, I do like fiction that has elements of poetry. The examples I have for that are, are Sharon Creech's Love That Dog, Black Flamingo, which is a new book. I think it makes poetry more accessible for somebody like me who really struggles with reading poetry. But I think I do struggle when a lot of really heavy poetic language is used in a novel. And I think that's actually what you're talking about. So I, I yeah, I kind of agree. I, I do kind of agree with that. It does make me struggle a little bit. Uh, I have not read Derek Owusu, but it sounds like something I should stay away from, from what you said about it. So thank you for that warning. And then for question two, I keep thinking of Gravity's Rainbow as something I should read as part of my Pulitzer project as an addendum because it actually was the book that the Pulitzer jury recommended for the win the year that it was published but the board of the Pulitzer Prize thought it was obscene so they refused to give it the prize 
So I've been thinking about reading it as an addendum, and that's a book that really intimidates me a lot. So that's the answer. And Andrew Russell's last question is, what is the most important element for you in a good work of fiction? That is hard to pin down. I think the most important thing for me in a work of fiction is a, is a unique perspective. But I think what irritates me the most in a book, which would probably make it the most important thing, ultimately, I get really irritated when there are basic plot holes or plotting that doesn't really make sense. I hate when I call it random act, I call it random acts of plotting. I don't like it when it feels like an author is forcing the plot to twist in certain ways because that's what they need it to do in order for there to be a plot. I, that really irritates me. So I, I guess the most important thing would probably be, I do really like a unique perspective and I like a reflective work, but in order to not irritate me as a reader, I, I think having the plot seem to flow organically and everything makes sense as things that the characters would do. I guess I want the characters to have agency and make it feel like they are deliberately doing things. And if I had to pick an example for a book that really leaned into this particular pet peeve of mine, it would be An American Marriage by Tayari Jones, because I feel like, especially the character of Celestial, did not make decisions or behave in a way that really made sense. She, it, the entire plot depended on her being extremely passive and not making it not, not make any kind of decision in throughout the entire book and I thought that was it and plus I didn't think the way things happened in the beginning made sense either please forgive the awkward cut right here but my phone has been really annoying lately and it just decided that its battery was dead even though it was not so I had to move over here where my phone could be plugged in and I can record at the same time. So it's just, an, you don't need to know that, except that that is why I'm suddenly in a different location. So I think where I had left off was A Marriage Story, Tayari Jones. I, I think the handling of Celestial's character felt very contrived, and a lot of the other things that happen throughout the book feel like Tayari Jones needs them to happen in order for there to be a plot, because the plot depends on Celestial not making a decision, it depends on a lot of other things, and it just ends up feeling really contrived to me. So that is why that book ended up not really being good for me as a reader. Although I can see why a lot of other people would like it. And I know a lot of other people do. It just really wasn't for me. And I hope that answers your question. So, by the way, I don't know if I'm going to get to all 25 because this is getting to be a really long video. But I'm going to, I'm going to try to get a couple of more in. And let's do Tisaya. What tropes in romance books do you least like to read? Any genres you absolutely cannot get into? So, I tend to think that the typical structure of a romance novel, or even a romantic comedy and movies, is really tired. It's very cliched. You always have that, you know, the, that setup where the two people meet. Usually they don't like each other in the beginning, but then they get around that, they fall in love, and then there's always this obstacle that separates them, and then they have to get over that in order to come together at the end. It feels very predictable to me. And as I just said, I feel like pre things that are overly predictable or feel, contri feel contrived, to me, are probably my biggest pet peeves in reading. So I think that's why romance tends to be a genre that I struggle with. But as I'm discovering in my Read Outside Your Comfort Zone challenge, there really aren't any genres that I don't think I would not be able to get into. I think, if anything, what I've learned is that just kind of picking and choosing and getting recommendations for people who know the genre really well seems to work very well for me. I've had a lot of success. I have not had a lot of failures. I don't think I've really had any failure yet, except me. Even, I'm listening to Hondo and I mentioned that I don't like it. The writing is great. It's that same thing where it's like the structure of the book feels problematic in especially in a modern context and too familiar and too predictable to me so even that one i'm, I'm still enjoying the writing so it's got that going for it so I, I don't think there's any genre i couldn't get into i will say the one that i tend to read the least of is science fiction and poetry because I don't know, I just, I, I have this 
barrier about like straight science fiction, it, it tends not to really interest me. And a lot of the stuff that I, when I was in high school, I read a lot of science fiction and most of it was bad. And I think that's where I have an aversion to that. And poetry I, I struggle with because I tend to feel like I don't get it and I worry about that. So I get stressed about it. But I'm finding that I can get around it. And I think that's one reason I want to read Ursula K. Le Guin, because I think that will be a science fiction book that will help me get around my hang-ups about the genre. So those, those I would say, are probably the two genres I actually have the most hang-up about, poetry and science fiction. But even there, I've already read a poetry book and loved it this year. So I, I definitely think there are ways for me to get around that. So there's no genre that I really don't think I could get into. And that's, uh, to me, I, I like the idea of being a well-balanced reader, so I kind of strive toward that. I'm not, I don't know if I'm there. I wouldn't say I am, but I, that's kind of my goal. I want to get to that point. Michaela Michaela says, could you give me a book recommendation? I love fiction and a lot of the books you've read recently. I think I know you from Instagram. If not, I'm sorry. <laughs> and if, if I'm thinking of the right person, I'm pretty sure you just read Real Life by Brandon Taylor. And I have not gotten to that one yet. Uh, just because it's so new and I just finished it, I'm going to say Hamnet. If you haven't read Hamnet, give it a try because I really loved it. I really did. So that's, that's what I'm going to say. That's my recommendation right now. You just happened to hit me on a day when I just finished it and I'm on a high with it. Sana A says, I just discovered your channel yesterday. I love small channels. Not that I don't want you to grow. It feels like a little treasure. You're, you're such a wholesome human. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, my question is, what are some non-English books and authors you like? I personally feel I've spent my whole life reading American and European literature, and I really want to broaden the spectrum. I, le I left the first part of that in, not, and didn't ju usually I try to just take the question when I, when I was moving these into a document that I could refer to. But I left that first part in because I think if my channel does continue to grow, it is very important to me to keep that kind of you know small channel feel and i don't really know what that I, I i so i guess one thing i'm kind of asking myself is what does that mean and what do i envision my channel looking like which is something i hadn't really asked myself before because i wanted to see if i was going to get the channel going and then i i didn't know if anybody was going to like it so you know but i guess yeah as, as as the channel grows i do have to start asking myself what i want it to be and look like and how to keep that small channel vibe and i think the answer is really the way i've actually approached a lot of it which is that i don't want to do something just because other people do it and because i i i worked in media and had was an editor and had to think about analytics and things like that it's easy to get caught up in things like well people don't like this or don't respond to this but they do respond to this like tags are hit and miss wildly hit or miss and individual reviews tend, people tend not to like but I like doing those things from time to time. So if there's a book I really want to talk about, I'll do an individual review. If there's a tag that really strikes me, I'll do it. So it's having that sensibility and maybe even doing things my own way. Like I talked about long lists last week and I'm not the kind of person who is going to commit to reading an entire long list, but I really like, and, and I mean, let's be honest, people like uh, long list, short list, winner reactions. So. There's a but when I thought about it last year, I found out I, I thought to myself, I think there's a way I can do that but still be me. So I think my answer for it, it wasn't a question, but my plan for a small channel is to try to keep those sensibilities and make sure I'm doing the things that I like as well as thinking about things that other people are going to like and finding that balance. And I think that's hopefully going to do the trick. We'll see. As for the actual question. I also grew up with a lot of American and European authors. That's basically all I read all the way through school. So I am kind of in the same boat. And I think part of my Read Outside Your Comfort Zone challenge is that I still am kind of, will find myself reading mostly American and European authors. So I don't really have a single author I can point to, which is part of the problem. And that's why I'm doing this challenge. But I think... I'm go looking forward to reading more Gabriel Garcia Marquez because so far I've only read one book of his and I have a buddy read planned on another one. And I want to read more Kobo Abe because I've only read one book of his. I want to read more Jose Saramago who is European, but I'm still throwing his name in there, you know. And I really want to try Nadine Gordimer for the first time. 
and she would actually be a good answer for the question I, I ran into earlier about author I haven't read but want to. It's Nadine, Nadine Gordimer. Throw her in with uh, Ursula K. Le Guin and Edward Stantecat. I believe those were the answers. So, you know, I, I, but the, the big reason I'm doing my Read Outside Your Comfort Zone challenge this year is to address things like that. And I think, I haven't really thought about plans for next year, but I have thought to myself repeatedly that I would actually like to extend the Read Outside Your Comfort Zone challenge to next year. So it might challenge for next year, maybe the same one that I'm doing this year. And I'll have to try to think of some ways to keep it fresh. But anyway, Rainbow Sky asks, well, who are your favorite gay writers? Well, I have to go with the ones I've read the most. E.M. Forster and James Baldwin. And E.M. Uh, e. Forster is my favorite author, so I can't leave him off the list. And I believe, if I remember correctly, he was out in his personal life, but not publicly. So, but and James Baldwin was out and proud and is yeah, a firebrand. I've loved everything by James Baldwin that I have read. So I would I, I would have to go with them. There are a lot of individual books by gay gay writers that I've read and enjoyed, but those are the ones that I've read the most and probably enjoy the most. Sorry, calendar appointment. So I got to try to find a way to wrap this up soon. But in the meantime, Jacob Meadows says, "Do you prefer to read in silence or do you have music playing in the background?" I simply cannot read with some, without some sort of background music. Uh, well, I. I'm kind of the opposite. I prefer it to be a little bit quiet. And actually part of that is because, especially as I've gotten older, I sometimes like to read out loud to myself, which seems weird, but I feel like it helps me be in tune with rhythm in a book, if it has it, because I am not a rhythmic person at all. And some things like Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry, that was a book that is actually fun to read out loud. And things like Toni Morrison said she actually wrote her books to be read, not out loud but to be read on the page but they have this rhythm to them nonetheless and if you read out loud you can you can find it and i i kind of enjoy doing that i can read if music is playing or if there's tv on i frequently do read sometimes my husband will put on something that i'm i'm not super interested in and i'll i'll sit and read while he watches it it's not the best situation for me because you know inevitably you will be a little bit distracted but i i can do it i do prefer to read with a little bit of quiet and if i'm by myself i probably will read out loud i don't know if that's a weird thing do other people do that or is it just me who knows all right let's do one more for now because this is getting really long and then we're gonna have to, i don't know how many i've lost track of how many questions that or how many comments that is so i'm gonna have to come back and do more let's end with gristle weimer gristle weimer i hope i'm pronouncing this correctly have you watched hamilton if so did you enjoy it i loved it so much i bought the book i did watch hamilton as soon as it was on disney plus in fact we subscribed to disney plus because hamilton was going to be available and i loved it i really loved it i have not read um, the book that it was based on by, I think, Walter Isaacson. But I would be interested in reading it someday to kind of see that perspective on the story. So, okay. I think that is going to be a good place to end this for now. And yeah, we still have a lot. We still have a lot to go. So I, I'm going to, being realistic, if I couldn't get to the first 25 comments in one video, I'm probably going to have three or four <laughs> Q&A videos. So here, here's what I'm going to say, because I'm sure people are going to have more questions. If you have a question based on something I've talked about in this video, let's stick with the theme. Or if you have a question I haven't talked about, odds I may get to it in another video, because a lot of later videos expand on some of the, or later questions expand on some of this. But so here's what I'm going to say. If you have another question, please do me a favor. Let's try to keep them all in one spot. I will put a link to the Q&A announcement video down below. Follow the link to that video and add your question as a comment on there. That, that'll that just make things easier for me because as I put these together, I'll have one place that I need to go to for questions. If you leave it on this video, it's not the end of the world. But if you can, please uh, follow the link to that and leave a question on that video. That way I would only have one place to look and we could do this easily. But if you do have another question or something you want to... Uh, you want have a question based on something I said here or just another question in general, please follow that link down below and we'll do it that way but otherwise if you have further comments about anything leave it down below this has been great fun so far and hopefully you've enjoyed it if you've made it this far into the video thank you for that and if you follow along again really really from the bottom of my heart thank you it is 
the feedback that I get in the comments and the idea of doing a Q&A and things like that, and having the sense of community is why I did BookTube in the first place. And I know I say that a lot, but I really do mean it. And it just means a lot to me that uh, anybody cares, really. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I will definitely be back with more Q&A. Like I said, my foster son is having surgery later this week. So I'm going to see if I can get another Q&A video done this week. And we'll see if I get to it. If not, I'll try to do one next week. And maybe I'll try to, do, I, I have to do part five of my bookshelf tour as well. So I'll see which one, if any, I can fit in before his surgery this week. And again, he's fine. Thank you for your comments and anybody who has um, wondered about it. But uh, yeah, he'll, he'll be fine. But that's coming later in the week. So anyway, I will definitely be back with more Q&A at some point. When I do, I will link it, I have more, I will link it down below. But until I, in the meantime, it won't be there. So anyway, thank you for your time. And I will be back. And until then, happy reading.